Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, um, thank you very much, uh, Noreen, for, for your introduction. And uh, um, thanks, colleagues, for coming to this session today. Uh, I, I realize that some of you, this is the second session in a short period of time. So if you want to fall asleep, no problem. Uh, I'll, I'll speak for about 30 minutes. Um, and uh, what I want to do or I'll tell you a little bit of background first, that um, this uh, paper is part of a special issue around the ethics of international development in education. And um, uh, really, I came to this uh, topic or, or this discussion um, in the wake of the US withdrawal from Afghanistan last year. Um, so a lot of colleagues in my area um, were lamenting the departure of the United States troops, and uh, particularly in relation to issues of gender and education. 
uh, with the argument that there was a lot of progress in education and gender during the, this period. And by withdrawal, it meant that a lot of uh, uh, girls' education uh, came under a threat. And I don't doubt that this is true, uh, just to be clear. Um, but I was also reflecting a little on the fact that um, the withdrawal didn't, the occupation of, of Afghanistan didn't only deliver girls' education, yeah? Uh, 176,000 people died during that occupation. Um, and uh, there were more than 46,000 civilians. So if the international community is going to take credit for girls' education, then maybe they also need to take credit for 176,000 deaths and uh, the civilian deaths. So it was there. It's a, it's a quite difficult topic, especially presenting to my colleagues who have been working in that area, but I think it's an important one. Um, now, it's also two decades uh, since 9-11 as a context where, um, as you'll see in this talk, education has been caught up in that post 9-11 war on terror discourse in a range of different ways that I will talk about. So, so really the, the, the central kind of point of the, of the paper is to try to unravel some of these discussions and to try to reflect on them a little and where a field of study relates to some of these human rights issues um, and the implications of that. Um, and I think that there is a broad issue here beyond the context of, uh, of Afghanistan around the relationship between Here's what I found. My, my phone, uh, my watch now listening to me and critiquing me that it doesn't <laughs> understand me. Uh, um, so there is also a broader thing that is happening, uh, particularly in the UK and the US, but I think more generally um, around looking back into history um, and reflecting on a range of issues around uh, gender, race, coloniality, and the implications of institutions in relation to that. Um, over the last years, during this COVID period, we've seen uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement raising issues of race and racism, uh, the Me Too movement uh, raising issues around gender and gender inequality, uh, gender violence. There has been a range of scandals around the international development community, uh, inequalities in power, and issues around imperialism and imperial interventions. Um, and I guess uh, part of my interest is to say, well, um, what about our field of research, international development and education? My own work, as Noreen mentioned, was on education and conflict. Where do we sit with these processes? Are we involved in these uh, violations? Um, are we separate? Are we neutral scientists that engage in topics but don't have any responsibility around that? So I guess the paper started to try to say, well, let's think of comparative and international education and more specifically education in emergencies and start to raise some of these questions. Um, now, back in 2014, uh, Roger Dale, sociologist of education, um, uh, in his uh, presidential address to the British Association of International and Comparative Education, he started to problematize this issue in relation uh, of the relationship between a field of study uh, and the topic itself. And often uh, people believe that uh, um, uh, the way that we study a topic is based on intellectual debates around uh, issues of methodologies and what are the best methodologies to study a certain topic. And uh, Roger started to ask questions around whether there was power relations involved in this, around which how uh, uh, topics are decided. So Roger says, uh, the starting point is that complexity, the complexity and significance of the relationship between fields of study as distinct and collective endeavors with that which they seek to explore, comment on, understand and explain are relatively rarely addressed. Exponents of fields often seem to proceed on the assumption that they're purely driven by the sets of methods, theories, concepts, approaches, and so on, 
and so on, that have been developed in the name of, for example, comparative education. And what Roger asked us to ask is, what are the conditions of production that determine what questions we ask, how we ask those questions, what subjects are, are deemed valid in our fields to study, and, and how can we understand that? Um, now, in relation to my own focus on the relationship between education and conflict, it leads you into these questions around where do researchers sit in relation to human rights violations uh, and injustices. Um, and historically, there have been a range of authors that have tried to raise these issues around the categorization of responsibility for, for violence, um, from Hannah Arendt to Mahmoud Mandani, uh, to more recently, a professor of Holocaust studies, Michael Rothberg, um, who wrote a very interesting book uh, called The Implicated Subject, Beyond Victims and Perpetrators. Um, and uh, basically, um, Michael Rothberg was trying to uh, raise issues around the legalization, if you like, of the way that we talk about responsibility for violence. Um, we talk about victims and we talk about perpetrators. And often we have a legalistic understanding of that. Um, but he makes the argument that there are many other categories of responsibility surrounding those victims and perpetrators that are implicated in the production of that violence. Um, so uh, for Rothberg, implicated subjects play essential roles in producing and reproducing violence and in inequality and are morally compromised and most definitely attached, often without their conscious knowledge and in the absence of evil intent to consequential political and economic dy dynamics, such that the violence could not have taken place without their involvement. Uh, now, he gives an example from the Holocaust, as he's a professor of Holocaust studies, of the train controller that was responsible for transporting the victims of uh, Nazis to the, to the concentration camps. And he argues that that person may not have known what they were doing in relation to the Holocaust, but without their actions, the Holocaust would never have taken place in the way that it did. And so that implicated subject starts to open up questions around to what extent are we responsible for things that happen in our midst? Is it enough just to look for the legally responsible person that pulled the trigger or should we ask about the conditions around which those human rights violations took place? And there we have the question of where do academic fields of study and research and practice, because actually the field that I'm talking about is very closely linked uh, to practice in the area of international development, research and policy are very uh, interacting, not just in terms of the object of study, but also in terms of the per personnel. In, in my own uh, area, colleagues are moving in and out of uh, academic institutions into United Nations or into uh, foreign government uh, state departments. And so I think that relationship is particularly uh, close. Um, now, uh, Michael Rothborg, he talks about two types of implicated subject. He talks about, uh, um, diachronic and synchronic implicated subjects. And the diachronic is in a sense, the kind of historical uh, injustices that manifest themselves in the present. And diachronic is uh, injustices that take place in the present and those that are implicated in that. So I'm gonna start reflecting a bit more on the field of international development uh, and it's in a sense relationship. Now, um, I don't know how many people study international development, but when we teach it, we always start in 1945, after the Second World War. And we start with this argument that uh, President Truman made the announcement uh, of uh, point four in a famous speech where he coins the word development. And he differentiates development from the colonialism of the past. 
The fair dealing of the United States will replace the colonialism of the past. Um, and uh, technology and uh, support uh, will replace the imposition of colonial rule in different countries. Um, and uh, Uma Kutari, who is pictured here, is a, a professor of development studies at the School of Oriental and African Studies. She argues that rather than understanding development as starting in the 1940s and teaching it like that, Actually, we should understand development as emerging out of colonialism, as the carrot linked to the stick. So you had the military carrot of uh, occupation in colonial situations, and, and you had the carrot uh, of aid, support, development, the social side, if you like. And she argues that we need to be wary of histories of development that deny this colonial genealogy and attempt to create distinct and artificial boundaries between the exploitation of empire and the humanitarianism of development. So for example, every year when I teach development, we begin the course. And uh, I ask the students, how do you feel about studying international development? And everybody is very happy. They're happy because they think that international development is a given good. If they were studying colonialism, I think they would be a little bit more tepid in terms of their attitude to that. Um, Umar uh, Kutari, in, in a sense, is saying to us, when we think about this, we should recognize continuity. And maybe even we should recognize that there are good and bad in both sides of that history. Of, of, of that relationship, but not to uh, see this as two kind of separations. Um, and I think that uh, uh, that's been an important, I think that's an important argument uh, to ground some of this. So if we take my own field and uh, the most, probably the most famous institute in the United Kingdom uh, that works on these issues of international education and development is the Institute of Education. Um, and in the wake of the Black Lives Matter uh, movement, um, uh, Elaine Unterhalter, South African colleague, and Moses Oketch, uh, Kenyan colleague, um, wrote a piece uh, reflecting on some of the implications of the Black Lives Matter protest for our field. And uh, they started to write a piece about the history of the Institute of Education. Uh, and they say, the early links with colonialism at the Institute of Education are clear. The Institute of Education was initially founded in 1902 as the London Day Training College for teachers. In 1927, the director accepted the appointment to a body with clear links with a number of colonial projects. The British Advisory Committee on Native Education in Tropical Africa. As part of the work for this committee, he was invited by the colonial office to establish a course at the Institute of Education to prepare students for work as education officers in Africa and to support missionaries preparing to work in teacher training colleges in what was then Tanganyika, now Tanzania. A colonial department was established at the Institute of Education in 1934 with a lecturer appointed to specialize in the comparative education of primitive peoples. Thus, inst institutionally, the teaching and research of the Institute of Education were clearly bound up with the colonial education project. In the 1940s, there was a change of name when the colonial department at the Institute of Education became the Department of Education in Tropical Areas. Only in 1973 was some distance from colonialism signaled in a new name the Department of Education in Developing Countries. In 1995, this became the Department of Education and International Development. Now, I guess the question here, um, in a sense, the continuity is clear, but I, um, maybe the, uh, the issue is whether, despite the name change, that we continue to carry out those tasks for empire, we continue to act in the interests of particular nations. Um, in, in many ways, international development is a, is a slight 
kind of uh, contradiction. On the one hand, uh, some argue that it's a process about uh, the rest catching up with the West, a process of development that leads to equalizing nation states. And the other uh, argues that international development is about maintaining the status quo, ensuring that uh, the West reproduces itself and the in inequalities of, of power. Um, and certainly in the case of uh, the Institute of Education and more broadly in our field, the question is, is which side of that do our colleagues sit? And how does that process happen in terms of the research, the policy, the practice work that we do? So I want to now um, just give you a brief history of the field that I've worked on for the last 20 years and to tell you the kind of evolution of the focus of that, where it comes from, and tell you that story. I don't say that I've got all the answers to uh, this question, but I want to just kind of raise some of the issues. So um, the field of education in emergencies really emerged in the late 1990s. So for the last, let's say 20, 25 years, and it emerged really out of uh, Jom Tien from the 1990s. So in 1990, the world community met in Jom Tien in Thailand and made a commitment to uh, education for all. Uh, first of all, it was quite broad, but it was narrowed down to universal primary education and gender equity. They, these were the kind of two main. So if you study education, normally people are familiar with this Jom Tien. One decade after the signature of this, in the run-up to a 10-year review, there was a recognition that over half of the children that were out of school lived in conflict-affected contexts. So there was a recognition that in order to address this issue, we needed to look at how is schooling affected by conflict and how can we ensure that more students. So this was the initial catalyst for the field. And uh, that recognition led to resources, uh, led to policy focus, which really led to a range of research that emerged in that. And as that uh, um, field has evolved, similarly, it's been affected and pushed and pulled by different political events. The collapse of the Soviet Union and the, and the end of the Cold War led to what became known as humanitarian intervention in the internal affairs of uh, actors. Contrary to United Nations uh, parameters of the non-intervention, there was an argument made that it was right to intervene into the internal affairs of a uh, country if the leadership of the country was not protecting the human rights of its population. Now, this has been a very selective intervention. Some countries are intervened in, some per countries are not. But the implication for education was that education in conflict was no longer being delivered on the borders of the countries, in refugee camps, but actually inside. It was during this period that the internally displaced person was uh, discovered. Of course, there were always internally displaced uh, people that were affected by conflict, but the international community didn't count them until this point. Prior to that, they only counted refugees that leave the country. So there was a shift in that, and it also meant that education practitioners started going in with peacekeeping troops, with intervention forces, and engaging in that. Out of that emerged a range of research about how best to deliver education in the midst of conflict, et cetera, as well as uh, continuing research. Post 9-11, uh, after uh, the events of 9-11 and the beginning of what became known as, the, as uh, the war on terror, education also became implicated in a range of different ways. Um, initially, after uh, the 9-11 uh, bombings, there, was an, uh, there were accusations that the majority of students in Pakistan were being trained uh, not in education in radical madrasas, but in uh, an education that taught them to hate the West. There was a range of statistics that were thrown out uh, around this uh, issue, and uh, later these figures were discredited and uh, but the the idea that uh, madrasas and islamic education was at the heart of this uh, conflict was signaled at that beginning as that developed a range of other issues that i'll come on to uh, 
uh, uh, were raised around gender in education, around radicalization in education, that meant that education post 9-11 took up a quite central issue in conflicts. That hasn't historically been the case. In fact, education historically in conflicts has been one thing that different parties could agree in. So for example, in the conflict in the civil war in Nepal, the Maoist guerrilla and the government, national government, the only thing they could agree on is education, protecting education. And famously, uh, um, a, a system was set up which was called education as zones of peace, which was basically an agreement by the two warring factions that education would be tried to be kept out of the conflict. It didn't necessarily happen quite as they expected, but the point is, is that education was one thing that both sides could agree on. That hasn't been the case in conflicts related to the post 9-11. Education has been at the heart of many of those issues and increasingly uh, politicized. And that politicization was not only about Afghanistan, Iraq and others, but also back into the UK and the United States. Um, issues around uh, the importance of education in de-radicalization, not only in uh, curriculum issues, but also in identifying signs of radicalization. So as a teacher in the United Kingdom, under national government legislation, you are responsible, statutorily responsible for identifying signs of radicalization amongst your students. This was new laws in the post 9-11 era and both uh, secondary school and uh, academics have to undergo training in order to do this. It's very crude and uh, produced a lot of unintended uh, consequences. But the point is, is that education was seen as a crucial site of uh, contestation. More lately, after the crisis in Syria, uh, we had a great deal of interest in education for refugees. Part of that was the mass exodus of Syrians from the conflict and the wish of European states to make sure that those refugees remained in neighboring countries. Most of those refugees are in Turkey, in uh, Jordan and in Lebanon. Um, and as a result of that, they put a lot of money into refugee housing, accommodation, et cetera, in, that, in, in those countries, but also into uh, education uh, processes. Um, now, essentially, what I'm making the case for here is that the field has evolved, not on the basis of what's the best way to deal with education uh, issues for children that are affected by conflict, but by the geopolitics of these processes, yeah? Uh, all of these issues led to funding being pushed into certain areas and removed from other areas. The focus, um, even international development as a crude, crude uh, level of uh, understanding. Um, we now give 50% of all our international development assistance in the UK to conflict affected contexts. 10 years before that, it was only around eight to 10%. So there's been a massive shift in focus on conflict affected context that is driven by some of these geopolitical uh, issues. Now, in 2014, 27, and also more recently with the peer network, um, I've been doing some reviews of the literature that has emerged during that period. Um, and uh, a lot of the critiques basically around the literature is that it's quite westocentric it's quite focused on very conjunctural issues around the delivery of education um, it's quite orientalist in its orientation in a sense that they often see the conflict is there afghanistan iraq uh, syria sierra leone and the relationship between the west is one of going in and helping but never really exploring those interrelationships that, you know, as, as arms provider, as fueler, as geopolitical actor, et cetera. A lot of those things are never asked. Um, it's often quite ahistorical. Um, and that essentially, those issues, I think I've been trying to link with this geopolitical arguments of the evolution of the field uh, to say that it's not by chance that the literature looks like that. 
because it's driven by certain interests, certain resources. Now, uh, Mahmoud Mandane, who is a Ugandan uh, professor, well, a very distinguished professor, um, he made a talk back in 2019 around uh, uh, at the uh, um, annual conference of the Development Studies Association in the UK. And he argued that development studies used to be the critique of empire, but it has now become the language of empire. Um, and uh, there is an institute on my campus at Sussex, the Institute for Development Studies. And it's been very famous historically in the 1960s, 70s as being a real bastion of critical thought. Um, today, uh, you don't see too much critical thought coming out of it. They work a lot on consultancies and projects for different organizations, and you don't see that. So I can see where Mamdani is getting his uh, argument from. So the question is, why is it that uh, the field is like that? And I guess there is a range of issues uh, that perhaps they don't affect you in the same way here. Uh, so let's say I'm speaking from my... Uh, UK European background. I've worked in two universities in the UK, one in the Netherlands. Um, is that in up my field, there are very few people that put the money up to do research. It's dominated by very specific international donors, uh, particularly the UK and the US, uh, the Netherlands for a while, um, and particular donors. It's imbued with these issues of geopolitics and power. Uh, often the research is very short term. Uh, contact, we need answers to this question within uh, two months. So perhaps that creates this lack of criti criticality because people receive and uh, rise. The issue of the commercialization of development and the rise of the consultancy firm is another uh, issue that's taken place. We didn't have those things in the 1960s and 70s when Mandani says the field was more critical. Um, and this rise of commercialization and, and consultancy has also affected the academy because for, for myself, 40% uh, of my time is research. We have to account for that 40% uh, of the research time by bringing in external money. So there is pressure, but that pressure is nothing like my colleagues in the International Institute for Development Studies, the development number one in the world for development studies, who each academic has to bring in three times their own salary every year, otherwise they go under special measures. Uh, so the pressure to produce uh, resources in order to survive means that perhaps you may ask the donor or whoever is funding you, what would you like to know? What are the answers that you're looking for? Because you're only as good as your last research project and you need to keep going. So the question then is about the difference between evidence-based policy and policy-based evidence. Now, this question of whether um, research is pointing towards things that are found or arriving at the things that other people want to find. And I think that increasingly, it's not only a question of saying the things that other people want, but it's also a question of who decides what is worthy, what is worth researching. And that's not just about countries, although that matters, no. It's also about topics. It's also about areas of education. There's lots of research in universal primary education. This has been the focus. Is higher education not worthy of that research? Is secondary education not worthy? Are other countries that are perhaps not so central to the geopolitical logics of certain Western powers that they don't deserve to be researched? So there are those questions that are thrown up uh, around the kind of worthy and unworthy topics and geographies uh, in our field. So in a sense, that's a kind of historical, I think, look at the why our field is imbued with those logics. Now I want to move to the synchronic and to think about the way that the case of Afghanistan, which is an extreme case, and I'm, I, 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 I want to say that it doesn't necessarily apply beyond that, but that maybe there are some essences that we can take from that and think about 
how uh, uh, it relates. Now, I'm going to begin in the wake of 9-11 with Colin Powell, then the head of the uh, US State Department, who called a meeting of all of the NGOs in the United States. And he called them to a big meeting and he made this speech. As I speak, just as surely as our diplomats and military, American NGOs are out there serving and sacrificing on the front lines of freedom. I am serious about making sure we have the best relationship with the NGOs who are such a force multiplier for us, such an important part of our combat team. We are all committed to the same singular purpose to help every man and woman in the world who is in need, who is hungry, who is without hope, to help every one of them fill a belly, get a roof over their heads, educate their children and have hope. Now, of course, the last sentence, it's hard to disagree with, no? But I didn't know when I signed up to get involved in this international development community that I was part of a combat team. I didn't realize that I would be mobilized in a military fashion, in a sense, for that process. And I think it's, it's those processes of, in a sense, interpolating the educator, the researcher, the institution to the military cause that I think has imbued uh, many different parts of the world uh, over uh, recent uh, years. Now, moving on to the question of girls' education in Afghanistan, it was certainly from the beginning uh, articulated that the plight of Afghan women and girls occupied much of that. So this is a quote from uh, the Times, which was the Time magazine, which was reflecting after the US withdrawal last year. The plight of Afghan women and girls occupied much of the Western rhetoric around the 2001 invasion of Afghanistan, accompanying the stated aim of eradicating Al Qaeda for its role in staging the 9-11 attacks. Educating Afghan girls, a, rally, a rallying cry of former First Lady Laura Bush in particular, became a US focal point in Afghanistan. Soon after the US invasion, tens of thousands of schoolgirls garbed in black uniforms and flowing white headscarves began attending schools across the country symbols of tangible progress that are still uh, touted by the international community. As a result of these discursive justifications, the education in emergencies community that went out there and supported these processes, uh, often alongside occupying forces, became implicated in these processes. Education and social services provision and policy and issues of gender equity contributed to the idea that US-led NATO forces were primarily there to bring modernity, equality, gender equity. Whilst parallels with the colonial era can sometimes be unhelpful, there is something uncannily familiar about the parallels between missionaries and their armies of empire and the role played by some of these NGOs with NATO forces. While this time they were not saving souls, they were often constructed as saving schools, saving women, saving children and the general population. While many noted the invasion of Afghanistan had little to do with female emancipation and much more about punishing the Taliban and de facto the whole nation for harboring Osama bin Laden, education and gender equity were powerful justifications for that process. And it wasn't just gender, uh, as I mentioned earlier, but education became mobilized in a range of ways. Tensions between secular education versus Islamic education, issues around education and radicalization, de-radicalization, and the use of schools and military funds for schools to support counterinsurgency strategies. There were a range of programs where the military worked alongside NGOs to construct schools, which was part of counterinsurgency strategies to win hearts and minds of the community. Uh, at the same time, the military issues would carry on in parallel. So the question is, you know, what role did we as a sector play? 
uh, in this process. Um, and I think it's important if you, if you think how important gender and education was projected on, now let's have a look how much money was spent on it. Jeffrey Sachs, well-known economist, uh, recently did an analysis of the, where the money went uh, in the occupation of Afghanistan. He says, according to a recent report by the Special Invest Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, the US invested roughly 946 billion between 2001 and 2021. Yet almost 1 trillion in outlays won the US few hearts and minds. Here's why. Of that 946 billion, fully 860 billion or 86% went to the military for US troops. And the Afghan people saw little of the remaining 130 billion with 83 billion going to the Afghan security forces. Another 10 billion or so was spent on drug operations, while 15 billion was for US agencies operating in Afghanistan. This left a meager 21 billion in, in economic support. Yet even much of this spending left little, if any, development on the ground because the programs actually support counterterrorism, bolster national economies, and assist in the development of effective, accessible, and independent legal systems. An estimate of Jeffrey Sachs' analysis would be that around 1.18% was spent on education during that occupation. So the rhetoric around social intervention is not matched with the amount of money uh, that was paid. Um, so I guess the question for us is to say, could it have been, could it, could, Thinking of Afghanistan and the two decades of occupation, could that have been sustained without the discursive justification that the West was there to help girls get access to education? Could it have been sustained without reference to the West's mission to support progressive secular education in resistance to the theological dogma of the Taliban? Maybe it could have, but it would have definitely looked different, less acceptable and less legitimate. In that sense, the education sector, its actors and supporters were integral parts of the system of violence and oppression. That was the US led occupation of Afghanistan. And just as we claim responsibility for increases in attendance and gender parity in education, we also have to recognize our implication in the corresponding death toll. Returning to the implicated subject, we can see how education and emergencies actors contributed to the discursive leg legitimation of the US-led occupation, failed to challenge its militarization of the education work, allowed co-option, weaponized education, and provided photo opportunities to sustain a military mission that was both flawed and failing. While much of this may well have been unintentional, our field must carry a degree of political and social responsibility for the system of violence and oppression that was enacted, a la Michael Rothberg. And that is a conversation at least I think we should be beginning, not least because we do know of the history of Afghanistan, uh, the use of the politicization of education. Uh, during the Soviet occupation, uh, the West sought to undermine uh, the Soviet occupation through running arms, money, and support through Pakistan. Uh, and uh, here uh, is a textbook um, produced through a uh, USAID-funded project in, the in 1984. Funded the, uh, the USAID in 1984 funded the University of Nebraska to develop textbooks for use with Afghan refugees in camps at the Afghan border. Between 1984 and 1994, 51 million was spent on producing and distributing over 13 million textbooks that were aimed at radicalizing Afghan youth to return from the borders of Pakistan to go and fight and join uh, the resistance to Soviet rule. Um, and this is a quote from a mass textbook um, there is, there is a, uh, a well-known academic um, in the Institute of Education that did their PhD on this. So this is just one example from many. And this goes, 
The speed of a Kalashnikov bullet is 800 meters per second. If a Russian is at a distance of 3,200 meters from a Mujahad, and that Mujahad aims at the Russian's head, calculate how many seconds it will take for the bullet to strike the Russian in the forehead. The power of these textbooks, um, obviously, is only one aspect of the support that went in, but it was certainly implicated in that process. And one can only imagine the long-term effects of this in different parts of the world, as uh, the successful um, victory of the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan led to uh, a whole range of other uh, activities. So in wrapping up, uh, just to, uh, to finish, I guess what I'm saying is, is that, um, I guess my points are the following. Uh, firstly, academics, uh, policy makers, practitioners, we have agency, even if that is conditioned, constrained and facilitated by a range of factors and actors. These constraints push us towards compliance, policy service for the powerful, and often work against the pursuit of social justice in and through education. They're also not without costs, personal and political. The case of Afghanistan highlights the way our field was implicated, not only in trying to salvage some humanitarian gains from the occupation, but also in gross human rights violations committed by NATO ISAF forces. And under cover of our collaboration, discursive subterfuge and failure to stand up and critique the way education was being placed at the service of imperial intervention. While the case of Afghanistan was both an extreme and a very presentist example, we have also seen how our field has been historically entwined with colonial and neo-colonial projects from the outset and must both recognize and, and assume some responsibility for this collusion a collusion that manifests itself in the reproduction of colonial, racial, class, gender hierarchies. Education is not a peripheral afterthought, but a central process and societal institution that affects the distribution and circulation of opportunity, of life chances, of futures. That is to say that our field matters and these issues are important. So just to kind of conclude, uh, I think that there are ways of reflecting on this and thinking about how to push back a little on a field that is dominated in these different ways. There is need to think through partnerships and power and speak out against injustices when they occur. There are need to challenge some of these binaries, North, South, Savior, Victim, Guilt, Innocence, towards more complex implications about responsibility. Um, there is perhaps a need to reset our lenses towards some reflexive scrutiny of the field itself and the donors. Often we always focus inside, we don't look at the machine that circulates around. And the final one, uh, which is the importance of diversifying researchers, resources, research frameworks, research partners, research themes, and rethink some of these things, which, you know, just to finish on, on the peer network, Part of the emergence of our peer network was the argument that the field is too Eurocentric, too, too dominated, and that uh, we now trying to work with researchers in Africa and Central Asia. So a new generation of researchers emerges in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, yeah. Um, well, I'm not a child psychologist, uh, you know, more political scientist, sociologist, so I don't have a great deal of background. But I think that, you know, we can all agree that, you know, education obviously has long lasting effects on, on people's minds. And, you know, clearly these type of textbooks uh, have their effect. Uh, but, you know, equally, uh, we could look around in all of our, our education and reflect on uh, what is taught and what is not taught, the absences in that, uh, the attitudes that are produced through those, uh, through those textbooks and the legacies of that, which, you know, is part of this issue that I'm talking about is that... Um, uh, as, a, as a British person, even though my father's Italian, my mother is British, I still, people think that I'm Italian in England, but I'm, I'm actually born in Birmingham in England and, and British. And uh, this conversation is extremely difficult in the UK to talk about the colonial links and the history of this process. No? There is a, um, uh, a famous uh, Guardian journalist who says that um, the British um, find it very difficult uh, to digest their own history. And as a result, it's starting to make them choke, uh, you know? And what he means by that is that, you know, we, we learn as a version of our history that is very positive. I'm sure that's the same in most countries, no? And sometimes it's difficult to open up that history. So just as I'm worried for the young Afghan children that have been subject to those books, I'm also worried for young British uh, uh, students that have grown up with a less than fulsome understanding of our own history. And I think that um, there are ways to deal with these pasts through education and through pedagogy. And I think Northern Ireland is a good example of where to look at uh, interesting uh, ways of teaching history and the different versions of history of the different sides, the Protestant side and the Catholic side and trying to bring communities together through different but shared understandings of issues. And I think that there is a, as an area, I'm sorry about the child psychology, I can't really help you so much, but I guess you get the sentiment. And of course, um, in our research, we look a lot about this of where um, the relationship between education historically the way that education has been understood in relation to conflict is a, as a victim. You know? When there is a war, education institutions get destroyed, education uh, subjects, teachers, uh, students get displaced. So it's a kind of negative understanding or victim understanding of education. And uh, we've done a lot of work of raising issues around the way that education might be implicated in the production of violence through segregation, social exclusion, language issues, all of these different dimensions. And we've looked at that chronologically as well to think about um, what kind of education would be good to prevent conflict before a conflict breaks out. What education is needed in the midst of a conflict and what kind of things can education do at that time? No? as perhaps delivery device for food, uh, for healthcare, but also for psychosocial interventions. And what can education do in the immediate aftermath of a conflict and in the long term in terms of wound, healing the wounds, the legacies of conflict. And so there is a literature on that, which of course crosses between this humanitarian development divide, no? And I think the bridges are there. Are, are, you know, part of the problem of that, that question or that, field is that there are often very different personnel that are involved in those periods. So in a humanitarian, uh, the humanitarian sector of the United Nations, for example, um, is quite separate from the development side. So sometimes there are different personnel and different ways of understanding problems. No, the humanitarian, it's all about saving lives. So they're focusing on saving lives. But sometimes in saving lives, the long term implications of that may may not be visible to them and vice versa. So there is communication that's needed there. I mean, there is a broader political question that you're asking around 
the possibility of intervention. Um, and my own feeling is if the international community were more transparent and honest about their selective intervention, it might make these things easier. But often some countries are deemed uh, to be um, not necessary for intervention and others are intervened in. And I think that the double moral of that makes humanitarian intervention quite complicated. I don't know whether I've answered you want to respond. Yeah, no, that's right. I've silenced everyone, sorry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think the two things are in contradiction. I also have a PhD student from Afghanistan uh, whose father was murdered by the Taliban for promoting education. You know? And I'm not disputing that uh, girls' education was one of the issues, and nor am I disputing the fact that post-invasion, there have been a range of scholarships that have facilitated my own PhD student to be evacuated uh, during that period. What I am saying is that if we look at the level of support for education vis-a-vis -vis other areas, and we look at the implications of intervention, then we might have said there was a different way to deal with this. No, I mean, uh, if you ask me, if I see a human rights violation here, and I intervene in that, and by doing it, I don't protect the three people there, but kill a hundred people, I think there is a moral problem with the intervention. Uh, similarly, one has to reflect on those, those issues. Um, unfortunately, that discussion is quite difficult uh, uh, to have, but uh, it's certainly true that a lot of people were facilitated to get out, but we shouldn't underestimate how many people were not facilitated to get out, how many people didn't get visas, how many people weren't allowed to leave, uh, and the implications of that. Yes. Yeah. That's that's an excellent question. So, I mean, just to break that down, um, uh, there was a there is a kind of generalized global myth uh, that more education is always good. But of course, uh, these kind of studies and broader work in, in this area will recognize that education can do as much harm as good. No? So it's a question of not what more education, but what type of education? How do we manage that? Um, and uh, you know, clearly, uh, the negative aspects, we try to challenge those and ameliorate them. So uh, racist education, segregated education, 
uh, there's a whole range of those areas that one could look at. Um, on the issue of Ukraine, I think this is a very important uh, discussion, um, particularly in the UK, where um, there has been so much um, uh, emphasis by the state um, on uh, telling one side of the Ukraine conflict that it's very, very difficult to open up a discussion. It's very difficult for people to talk about. Uh, I'll let you find the off button. <laughs> um, it's very difficult to, to have an open debate. Um, and as a result, people are, um, are saying things in the UK that they probably would never have said in other contexts and conflicts where a more balanced understanding of what was going on was represented. So there is a kind of Russia phobia that is manifest in the UK, which is going unchallenged by all sides, which is really quite unsavory. Um, so for example, some universities are refusing to accept Russian students into their universities. And this I oppose, yeah, and I've opposed it in my own institution, which hasn't, by the way, uh, refused access for university, but it's other universities have done that. And also to argue in the importance of people to people solidarity, no? We are not always responsible for our national governments. Some of us don't get to vote for our national governments. Some governments are imposed on us. Um, so the importance of dialogue between uh, people is an important part of that. And so um, I think uh, uh, that is our hope at the moment to try to prevent this polarization that is manifesting itself very, very strongly across Europe to try to open up channels of communication uh, between Russia, uh, you know, even to the extent that those Russians that were fleeing in the borders, uh, some people in the UK were arguing that, oh, uh, we shouldn't accept them and look after them in the countries because um, they're responsible for their governments. You say, well, you know, that implication, as I was talking about it, is always relative. No, how can you uh, talk about this? So I think there is important dialogue and then clearly education uh, is important. Um, in that discussion, but it's not easy to talk about this issue in English education at the moment. Very difficult, very difficult to raise these issues and discuss it. Um, there is, in a sense, a collective national narrative about the conflict, which I think needs to be opened up, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's a work in progress, I would say. Um, just coming back uh, to the question before, which was about legacies, um, the US has been intervening in Afghanistan for many years uh, before the uh, post-Cold War, many experiments in modernization and modernization. And I'm sure there is a legacy, there will be legacies of, of all of those uh, uh, education interventions, um, both positive and negative, no? Um, uh, but, uh, you know, that's again, something to, for us to study historically now to see what happens. Uh, Clearly, the situation is very bad at the moment, yeah? And I'm not in any way defending the Taliban when I critique the, the Western intervention. I'm just trying to present the other side of a story that seems to have been romanticized in the Western media, uh, that the West was all about protecting girls and supporting education when there were many other issues and interventions and victims. Uh, that manifested themselves through that occupation. Thank you. 
There's always hope. There's always hope, but um, uh, hope, I think, emerges also from critique, you know, that you have to understand the society in order to challenge it. But um, uh, there are different funders. There are different ways of doing research. There is different people-to-people -people strategies of uh, breaking through these uh, things, but that has to also be a conscious effort of people, no? Uh, and first of all, that's why I say it's very important to teach students uh, the politics of education, not only education pedagogy. Um, Roger Dale, who is a sociolo sociologist of, of education, um, he used to talk about education politics and the politics of education. Education politics was what happens inside the classroom, pedagogies, and the politics of education is the relationship between the education system and the local, national, and global political economy. You know? And I think that that side often doesn't get taught to students. And it's that side that can help the student to negotiate their pedagogy. And so I think that, you know, the, the education is important. So um, I started teaching a module on education and conflict uh, 15 years ago in Amsterdam. And the reason I did it was that we noticed that many of our students, their first jobs were in conflict affected contexts because of this shift in money, money was going much more towards conflict affected. So they were trained in these traditional development studies or pedagogy areas, but they weren't taught anything about the politics that was going on around them. So they were arriving in these places and not being able to uh, decipher, decode what was going on. And as a result, sometimes getting caught up in some of these processes. No, so I think that um, you know, there is a range of things that one can do, uh, both in terms of diversifying the way that we think about it, but also in terms of research funding and support. And we can look to other parts of the world as well for solutions and ideas. No? Uh, Latin America, uh, of an area that I've worked in for many years, has many interesting uh, strategies to address complex multicultural societies and how you deal with those. There are a range of possibilities, I think. You know? So optimistic uh, about the future, even if I sound very uh, uh, hard and uh, pessimistic. Thank you. Huh? No, we all went together, uh, three of us. So first to me, then to them. No, it was fantastic. And thanks very much for inviting me. We really, really enjoyed it. See you tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, but very interesting. Again, like, like a reminder.